Good morning, College Church. We're going to get started a little bit early this morning. Praise God, we have a baptism. So if everybody will watch the baptistry, we're going to see Ashton Stone get baptized. I've had a few phone calls like this in my life, but this uh, yesterday I got a phone call from Ashton saying that he was ready to be baptized. And so um, we decided that he would like to do that this morning uh, in the presence of the congregation that he's grown up in. So Ashton, I'm going to ask you the most important question that I'll ever ask you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes, sir. Based on that confession, I'm going to baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. Amen. God, let's stand and worship this morning. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to
Just a reminder, we start with sopranos, and then the basses come in, and then the altos, and then the tenors. My soul magnifies the Jesus Christ, my living 
turning to 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 17, I'd like to thank Jordan and the worship committee for asking me to read this morning. When it was first emailed to me, in the bulletin it says faith scripture, but I, I, they said favorite scripture, so I'm one of those weird people who doesn't have favorites. I, we're annoying, I know. When you ask us to go somewhere to eat, we're always, I don't know. So I have preferences, but it really depends on the mood I'm in as to, is it, as to what, and there's Lots of verses and books in the Bible that I enjoy, including, weirdly, Job. Job's one of those weird books. Deciding what I wanted to share this morning was challenging because of this. Um, I had to go back and review, okay, what are the parts of the Bible that I enjoy? What, are, what do they mean? And how do I approach them? So it forced me to think and to stretch in ways that I encourage all of you to do. Now, turning to our reading, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, starting in verse 13. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense for anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good than it should be for God's will than for doing evil. Now, I ended up deciding to go with this scripture for a couple different reasons. First, in my family, apologetics is kind of a big deal. For those of you who don't know, apologetics is the study of giving evidence, a logical response to the defense of Christianity. So my dad loved apologetics. In fact, my mom took apologetics in college as or on a recommendation from him, and their apologetics professor did their wedding. So that kind of shows how it's been done in our family. Um, my dad has maintained his healthy interest in that in his whole life. In fact, I have lost count of the amount of material he's produced and the amount of books he's bought on this subject. When I was introduced to the subject as an, in an academic sense, it was in the eighth grade at Greater Atlanta Christian, and we were using Dr. England's book, God, Are You Really There?, which I highly recommend. And I've fallen in love with the subject. In fact, I took an elective in college, and it was the hardest C I've ever gotten. Second, and so this, this verse resonates me because of that history and this love of the subject. But second, and you'll have to forgive me here, I was raised by a preacher and trained, in a, trained as a historian, so ignoring context is impossible for me. Second Peter, or First Peter, excuse me, is, can honestly be viewed as a guidebook for Christians living in a hostile culture. And I feel that that is becoming more and more relevant in today's world. Our culture is moving farther and farther away from God. And by looking at Second Peter, you get an idea of how Christians are to approach that. And this verse, verses 15 and this section in specific are about how Christians approach the suffering that we undergo in this world. Let's face it, we're in a fallen world, and we have to deal with that fact. But by the, the way we approach that suffering and handle it is the greatest example of God there is. And it may be the difference between 
someone coming to Christ like Ashton did, did this morning or ignoring it altogether. So I ask you to meditate on these, on what I've said, and go, join with me in prayer. Our righteous and almighty Heavenly Father, we come before your throne in humility this morning. We ask you to bless our worship, and we hope it is reverent and obedient to your will. We recognize that we are mere brief travelers on this earth. We ask you to bless our journey through this life. Help us to use what you have given us and taught us to be examples in a hostile world. Help us to follow your will in all that we do and always look for opportunities to share the good news of your son and his sacrifice for us. We thank you for sending Jesus to live among men and ultimately die as the, as the atoning sacrifice offering ultimate salvation for us. We especially rejoice in Ashton Stone's decision this morning. We ask a special blessing on him and his family and us as a church as we help and be example and teach him as he embarks on his new life in Christ. We now bring before you those specifically mentioned this morning in the bulletin in need of particular recognition. Robbie Dunning, Barbara Garnett, Doris Harris, Mary Woody, and be with the family of Clint Watts. We know there are other concerns of our family which may not have been specifically mentioned this morning. We know you're aware of them, and we know that you will do whatever is in your power to help them. We ask you to bless us as we continue this worship and as we leave this place in your son's name. Amen. Thank you. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope. In this world where we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart. Holy words of our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice. Oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world and they resound with god's own heart oh let the ancient words impart ancient words ever true changing me and changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart ancient words ever true changing me and changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart sing this next song before we take communion and Ashton gets to participate in it. There is a Redeemer
been going to church in this room for over 70 years. For over 60 of those years, I sang with the uh, Harding Chorus Academy or the college or directed a chorus. I've traveled a lot on chorus trips, have many good memories of interesting places, of a lot of friends, former students and colleagues, of wonderful music, of potlucks, especially at the College Church, uh, College Avenue Church in El Dorado, where my brother was an elder for a number of years. I loved taking the chorus down there because when they did potlucks after church, they would set out four or five tables and fill them with meats and uh, they had breads and salads, even vegetables. <laughs> and of course, an entire table for desserts. And the chorus got to go through first because we were ready to sing. And uh, we, we got the first pickings. Potlucks and group meals have a long history in the church, don't they? Longer than we often think. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. While they were eating, Jesus did this. The early church followed this example of having a meal together and as a part of that meal, celebrating the blood and the body of Christ. It was customary. You remember when Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 11, he said, yes, you're doing this, but you're not doing it right. It's not the Lord's supper you're taking because some of you get there early and you go ahead and eat and you don't wait for the others. And when they arrive, they don't have any food and they're hungry. You're not paying attention to the body, the body, that body and this body. The church in Troas, you remember when Paul visited there? He arrived on a Monday. He had to wait an entire week to meet with the church. They met on a Sunday evening. Paul talked with them until midnight. Eutychus fell out of the window. Paul had to take care of that. And afterwards, what did they do? They went back upstairs and they ate. They ate with each other, celebrated. By the way, Jordan, there's biblical authority for going to sleep during the service. In the early second century, the governor of Bithynia wrote a letter, a series of letters to the Roman governor Trajan because he was concerned about this group called the Christians. And he examined a number of them, questioned them about what was going on. And he wrote to Trajan saying, as far as I could determine, it's, it's fairly innocuous. And they meet on a given morning before daylight, before the sun rises. They sing a hymn to Christ as to a God and then they pledge to each other to live lives that are holy and righteous, that, that they fulfill their word, that they represent to the community properly. Then they dismiss and then they reassemble to take a meal together, a meal of rather ordinary food, he said. This custom persisted for a number of years and in the early days of the church when they met in homes, homes such as that of Priscilla and Aquila or Aristarchus or Nymphus, uh, or when they met in rented rooms, it was easy with 20 or, 34, uh, 20 or 30 or 40 people to eat together and to visit with each other. And then one of them might sing a song and one of them might have a word of prophecy, the word of God. Uh, they interacted with each other. Uh, it's a little more difficult for us to do that today, isn't it? Our customs and our sitting arrangements don't encourage the visitation and the interaction that they might have had then. An onlooker, as he's looking at what we're about to do now, might say, well, that's not much of a fellowship meal, is it? I mean, the portions are so tiny, it's almost insignificant. And you're not looking at each other. You're sitting where somebody's by your side or your back or in front of you with their back to you. 
So uh, what sort of meal is this? But we don't assess a family meal by the quantity of food that we take. <laughs> we assess it by the quality of that food and by the people with whom we share it. So here we are about to partake together. How important is this meal? Well, who could ask for better company? We're taking this with Jesus, with his apostles, with Christians, those who have followed him throughout history and throughout the world. We're taking this with the whole community of saints, with this congregation, with other congregations in this community, with, with those of you who are visiting online, we're celebrating this meal together with our families and our friends. What better company could we have? And what more important food could we be taking than this tiny morsel, but which represents the body and the blood of our Savior, and which we acknowledge as we take that? It's small, but it's hugely significant, and it reminds us of Jesus' love and sacrifice for us. I think my brother Charles would agree that the meals at El Dorado were wonderful. They were tasty and they were fun, but they're not nearly as important as this meal that we're taking uh, this morning. Let's thank God for this. Our Father, we are grateful for this bread that reminds us of who we are, of whom Jesus calls us to be, of his sacrifice for us and your gift to us. We're reminded that this bread represents our release from the bondage of sin and our fellowship with each other that ties us throughout eternity and throughout the universe to those who follow you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray together. Dear God, as you blessed this cup at Jesus' request 2,000 years ago, we ask that you bless it today, that it brings us spiritual effect as we remind ourselves of our communion with you and of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. In his name we pray, amen.
pray. Father, we're grateful for the spiritual and material benefits, services that this group of people provide to this community, to this area, and to the world at large. We pray that these resources will be used well, that they'll be effective, that people will respond to hearing about you, that the physical blessings will be encouraging to them. You know, we pray that you'll guide the, uh, the use of this money and help us as we contribute to realize our portion in this important activity. In Jesus' name, amen. On bended knee I come, with a humble heart I come. as we dismiss children ages three through first grade during this next song the children's worship and again we thank all who always help with children's worship amen over all the earth you reign on thought as we sing this. In Christ, we battle from a place of victory, not for victory. In heavenly armor, we'll enter the land. No battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. No battle belongs to the Lord.
Welcome to College Church. We are so glad that each and every one of you are here this morning, especially if you are visiting with us. And if you're looking for a church home, consider placing membership with us here at College Church. We are seeking revival for ourselves and for our land so that we might be able to revive others. In Psalm 85, verse 6, the psalmist asks, Will you not revive us again, O Lord? that we might rejoice in you. 2 Chronicles 7.14, we know this by heart, let's say it together. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. That is the recipe for revival. And we have seen it played out time and time again in the lives of Josiah and Elijah, Manasseh and Paul, the early church, and now we're looking for it in our own lives. It begins with humility and prayer. Do you remember a few years ago when we had that series on prayer? Noel and I think it was probably around 2018. We all got a prayer journal and we worked through different aspects of prayer. I remember the first week a man came up here and said, I'm not very good at praying, but I'm looking forward to growing in this series. Will you bow with me? And he went on to lead one of the most beautiful, heartfelt prayers I had ever heard, showing that you don't have to be good at prayer in order to pray good. Grant and other leaders in this church, I know when they're conducting Bible studies, will often invite the seeker to pray along with them so they can grow in this spiritual discipline. It's something that we have to grow in. Even Jesus' own disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, pray in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, we could say this together, right, King James? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We can grow in prayer. Not in content, for God knows what we need even before we ask. Not in posture. Some of us prefer standing up while others prefer to sit down or kneel. Some of us prefer to pray as we're driving along the road or maybe while we're on a walk. But to grow in our conviction, to grow in our belief that when we pray, God hears us and God is going to heal our land. Someone who is good at praying is typically called a prayer warrior. We have many prayer warriors in this congregation. Many of you pray over the names in our bulletin each week. And when we get the attendance cards after Sunday service, many of you want to know immediately so you can pray for whatever new concerns have come up. Some of you keep your own lists, maybe a prayer journal, so that you can pray specifically for those in your life. But you don't have to have any credentials or a badge to be a prayer warrior. All you have to be willing to do is to pray for every single war. Physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, financial, relational. Every battle, every conflict, praying that God will intervene. One of the first prayer warriors in the Bible was Jehoshaphat. We can learn a lot from this king for our own spiritual discipline of prayer. If you will, please turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles 
20. We'll be there in just a moment. A little background here. Jehoshaphat was king in the 9th century. That's right. He was a king who prayed. A king who studied his Bible for, according to Deuteronomy 17, every king of Israel was supposed to copy the Torah by hand. That's Genesis through Deuteronomy, or at least Deuteronomy. Can you imagine what would happen if all of our leaders from the White House to our own houses copied Scripture by hand, learning its contents and teaching it through our lives, how that would change the world? Joshua was the great, great grandson of David, and he was great, great. Now, he wasn't perfect, but he was righteous. He ruled at the same time as Ahab and Jezebel in the northern kingdom. And Ahab tried to get Jehoshaphat killed by convincing him to trade clothing and battle. But when the enemy approached Jehoshaphat, he cried out to God, and God saved him. Because he was righteous and because he always prayed, including in this most dramatic episode, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Look at verse 1. It says, After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, and with them some of the Munites, those are the Edomites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Now, these are all relatives, going all the way back to Jacob and Esau, who were twin brothers in the womb. And Ammon and Moab were the offspring of Lot, Abraham's nephew. But these three relatives were not coming over for a picnic. They were coming over for battle. And this battle goes all the way back to their childhood, where they were always at war. But we're not told that the Israelites had done anything on this occasion to prompt these three nations to come against them. Sometimes you can be doing everything right and the enemy attacks. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, from beyond the sea, and behold, they're in Hazazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. They are right in front of you, as some of us today might have a battle right in front of us. It might be a spiritual battle that we're going through right now. Maybe no one else knows about it. We haven't shared it with them. Maybe it's a health struggle that you or a family member are going through. Maybe it's a financial crisis that you're needing some deliverance from. Maybe it's some hostility or animosity with a family member or a friend and it's been heating up. Or maybe it's just beginning you feel like the enemy is right in front of your face at En Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid. He set his face to seek the Lord. He proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah they came to seek Yahweh. These are the four things that we all need to do when the battle is right in front of us. The first thing he does is he's afraid. And that's a natural response. That's, in fact, a good response. It keeps us from pride, from believing that we can handle this in our own strength. The second thing he does is he seeks the Lord. He takes his eyes off the enemy, and he looks at the one who's going to deliver him from the enemy. We can't look the enemy in the eyes. We might become too afraid, but when we look at God, we know that he can deliver us. The third thing he does is he proclaims a fast. That is, he gives up a good in the present for an even greater good in the future. Sometimes we have to give up something that we we need right now for something we need even more later on. And lastly, he calls together all the assembly, men, women, and children, because this matter, this war, involves the entire family. And they all come together, and they all pray together, because it's going to take more than just one person to find deliverance here. I've asked Darren Matthews, one of our shepherds, to lead us in a congregational prayer. We are halfway through this year. We've seen many challenges so far, as well as many blessings. But we're going to see ahead of us in the next six months other challenges, some we don't even know of yet. In fact, this week at Caruso, we had a lawyer come and speak to us about many of the civil and religious liberties that we enjoy, 
as well as some of the challenges that are coming down the pike. We need to pray in advance for those challenges we don't yet know, as well as the blessings that we have not yet received. Also be thinking about your own individual concerns as we pray together as a family. Darren, would you lead us? Dear God, as the psalmist says, we praise your name, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. You are my loving God, my fortress, my stronghold, and my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge. As we are about to read, Lord, the account, the prayer of Jehoshaphat, praying to you as he goes into battle, We come to you in prayer, God. We know through scripture that we are in a battle right here in our land, in our own hearts, minds, and bodies, we are in a battle. We see and hear in the society that surround us the state of confusion that people live in. They believe that they don't need you or they They've turned their back on you, or they they just don't even know you. Help us, God. Help us to be the light to them to overcome this battle. We recognize, God, our, our own health is a blessing from you. And many are in a battle over diseases, cancer, mental anguish, things that that we are asking God, that we we ask for your presence and strength to help us to overcome these many battles and to let our light shine for Jesus, whatever our circumstance. You have created us, God, to be relational. And in some situations, we have messed that up in our own families and with our own friends. And Satan attacks us in these areas, God. A lot of it, a lot of times, it's with pride. Help us to seek forgiveness and love to make those relationships right. Because we want to work together, God, for your good. We are in a battle right here uh, as a body of believers at the college church. We seek to have a vision and to serve and please you, God. And with our planning and re-energizing of our vision for the road ahead, I know Satan wants complacency. He wants it to grow stale. He doesn't want us to find the time and the energy to disciple, to grow ministries, and to welcome and serve our community. We pray, God, for strength to overcome these battles. God, as we live our life, we recognize, as Jordan said, there are many battles we do not even know yet. And I'm mindful of our young families and the growing of their relationship and their marriage. As they grow their families with children, may they always raise them up in the Lord. We're so thankful as just what we've witnessed this morning with Ashton. And there's others that are out there that may be battling to give their lives over to you. We pray for them, God. And God, we want to thank you as we look back on our lives, as we reflect and we see the many battles that you have helped us overcome. You have given us strength, and we are thankful for the healing that we have seen. We are are many prayers that have been offered in difficult circumstances, hurdles that have had to be overcome, and you have delivered us. God, as we close our prayer, ultimately, we want to trust in you. As Jehoshaphat states, we want to pray that our eyes are upon you. We pray that we will be strong and courageous and know that the battle belongs to you. Amen. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord, before the new court. That is, he was standing right in front of the temple, with the people right in front of him. We might say today, with God behind me, and Christ before me, 
and the Holy Spirit within me. What can I not accomplish? As he stands before the people, he says, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. That is, there is no God like you, who delivers from lion and bear, from Goliath, from Pharaoh, from sin and death itself. There is no one else that we could put our trust in in these moments when he's surrounded by the enemy. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? You've delivered before when I've been in a crisis financially, when I've been in a situation with a family member or a friend, when I've struggled with sin in the past, you've delivered me, you've delivered others as well. I know that you can deliver yet again. And they have lived in it and have built for you a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, whether sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, and we cry out to you in our affliction, you will hear and save. You see, that's the reason why the temple existed. It was a reminder of a house of prayer. As long as it stood, they would turn toward it and pray, knowing that God would hear. As long as there is a church, as long as Jesus himself exists, we know that God hears our prayer and that he answers. You know, sometimes we can be guilty of thinking of God like a genie. We get three prayer requests and that's it. Uh, We might even think that we've used up too much. God has delivered us so much in the past. We seriously become a little hesitant to ask for any more deliverance. As long as the church stands, as long as Jesus exists, God will not run out of mercy. He will not run out of love. He wants to hear your request, and he wants to grant it. That's the reason why we exist, to turn to God. And they have returned this by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you've given to us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. The first step is to realize that we are powerless. That is humility. To realize that we are unable to get out of most situations without God. The second step is to realize with God on our side, there is no battle that we will lose. We will always be victorious in the end. There's this beautiful scene in Revelation where the angels are gathered around the throne and their primary responsibility is to collect all the prayers of the saints so that at the final judgment they might cast them down so they might be fulfilled. Because every prayer request we've ever prayed will be granted. For the loved one who is sick, they will become better. For the lame, they will walk. The one who is blind will see. The poor will become rich in the kingdom of God. I want us to think about the power of deliverance, that day when all of our prayer requests are finally granted. I've asked Todd to lead us in a song to think about this deliverance. As we sing it, think about that thing that you want God to deliver you from. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power.
little ones, their wives, and their children. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Hazael, the son of Zechariah, who was of the sons of Asaph. That's the worship leaders at the time. He said, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. That is, here's the word of the Lord. A prophet is speaking. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed at this great horde. For the battle is not yours. But gods, tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. They'll be right in front of you. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. That is both good news and terrifying. Stand firm. Hold your position. And see the salvation of the Lord. On your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. you know, I, I would much rather the Lord tell me, if I was in that situation, to strap on my armor and to grab my sword and to go out and fight until the death. But he says, stand there. Do nothing. While your wife and your children are by your side. Bruce mentioned on Wednesday night, he said, a mother is only as happy as her most unhappy child. When someone in your family is in crisis, you're in crisis. God tells Jehoshaphat and all the people to stand there, men, women, and children, not to fight, but to stand firm, hold your ground, and see the salvation of the Lord. Show your children that you're not the one who's going to win this battle, but God. Rather be like David or Joshua or have a story like Gideon. At least Gideon had some jars and some torches and a, a trumpet. Standing there is not the absence of action. It's the presence of faith. It's trust in God. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping. As the enemy is approaching, they begin to sing. Verse 22, it says, And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah so that they were routed, completely defeated. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. That's the language of Joshua. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. The enemy defeated itself. Evil devoured evil. The, the foolish man's house went splat, just as God has commanded in the end. God's people are victorious. The person who gossips about you today is gossiped about tomorrow. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? Because of the resurrection of Jesus, the victory is for God. God wins the battle in the end. In fact, it is such a full victory that when they get to the battlefield, there's all this plunder. And they spend three days gathering all of the gold and the silver and the clothing, just like when they left Egypt in the Exodus. Just like after three days of Jesus being in the tomb, he is risen and he has plundered hell of all of those who were taken. In the end, God wins. And the fourth day is a new beginning. You know, Jehoshaphat woke up that morning, not knowing exactly what would happen, wanting to probably reach for his armor, his sword, but instead he got down on his knees and he prayed because he realized the first step toward being a prayer warrior is prayer. It's also the last step, and therefore everything in between is full of faith. There is no battle that we cannot win with God on our side, and there's no battle that we can lose with him there. I was also reminded when Bruce spoke last week about a, a book he had all of us read called The Hiding Place 
about uh, Corrie ten Boom and her family sparing all of these Jews during one of the, the most hate-filled times in our history, the Holocaust. And, and you can't read a chapter without seeing scripture and a prayer on every single page. This family was not the target of this particular war, but they saw a larger war going on, and they wanted to be a part of the right side. They strapped on their armor, and they went out to fight. This morning, maybe the only thing that you can do, the only thing that you need to do is to stand firm, hold your ground, and see the salvation of the Lord. There are battles that are going on right now. There are battles yet to come. But the only battle we won't win is the one that we don't take to God. This morning, if we can assist you by praying for you, please come as together we stand and sing. When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. You are the life, you are the fight within my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When water dries, I lift my eyes up to the throne. We are Good morning. Good morning. Hasn't this been a great service? Amen. If you don't feel the greatness, it may be true of you what Zig Ziglar, the great motivator, once said, you may need a check up from the neck up. <laughs> uh, uh, we appreciate your being here this morning so much. Uh, if you're a visitor, we want you to know that you're an honored guest. And we hope we'll have an opportunity to get acquainted with you. We also hope that you would be interested in maybe considering the Cottage Congregation uh, as your home church. We'd love for you to connect with us, and you can do that online. One of the things that, of course, made this service so great was the very beginning. Uh, as we saw uh, Ashton being, born, being baptized by his father, uh, John, at the beginning of the service. And speaking of baptisms, we also know that Kobe uh, Hutcherson was baptized Sunday, June 30th, by her father, uh, Daniel Hutcherson, at the, in the Harding Fountain. So we congratulate these two uh, in their becoming Christians. Also, we want to remind you of our summer Wednesday nights. They continue and uh, through this Wednesday night. And of course, this Wednesday is the time that we will divide into teams and pack some 10,000 meals, all to benefit the ministry of Mission Paracristo in Nicaragua. 
Uh, our youth group will be serving in Nicaragua alongside this ministry uh, later in the summer. Our night of service this Wednesday is for all ages. Uh, there will be no Bible classes on this Wednesday, July 10th, except the early bird class will meet at four. Uh, there won't be any interference uh, with them meeting at four with being able to do this uh, packing of meals. In fact, if you're in the early bird class and want to come back at 630, I know they'll be glad to have you join them also. Uh, we appreciate your being here again, uh, and we pray that you would uh, continue to let us help you in any way that we can. Wow, what a service. And I got to pray. <laughs> How do you do that with a sermon that was like that? I hope you all still have a prayer journal. I do. It's about 15 pages long. Names I spend in prayer every day. It's very few days that I miss praying for everybody, for our congregation. And I really hope that you do too. First, what I'd like to do is read a scripture from Psalms 2. It says, For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk his blameless, for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Everybody who's a Christian know that the devil is after you big time. He's already sent probably a bunch of angels for these two new ones who were just baptized. Don't let them get to you. Keep yourself faithful to the Lord. Shall we pray? Almighty God and Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We are amazed at your goodness and your mercy towards us. And thank you again so much for sending Jesus to earth for us to have our sins taken away. And again, we are pleased beyond all words that Colby Hutchison and Ashton have put you on as their savior. Thank you for being with us in our worshiping you today. May we have paid attention to the words in the songs that we were singing and in your holy word, words that were read to us. Father, Please be with those in our congregation who are sick, fighting cancer, those who have lost loved ones, and also be with our armed forces, our first responders, and everybody that is going on mission trips to this summer, those that are already there on mission trips. God, please be with their preparation and the mission that they are there and God may you please bring many soft hearts to you that we might be able to help you bring people to the Lord and God please help us to bring our country back to you be with our upcoming elections and please May we as a nation put godly men in office this term. Thank you for being with Jordan this morning and the lesson that he has he prepared for us. May we have listened attentively to the words and may we do what you want us to do. Be disciples. We know that you hear our prayers. 
May we be diligent with this in our lives. And again, we honor and praise you and offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.